So this talk is on responsive game design. It's about bringing desktop and mobile games to the living room. My name is Jesse Freeman. I'm an HTML5 and game developer evangelist at Amazon. And my job is to help developers bring their game to our platform and also make the best games possible. So this talk is going to go over some of the strategies that I've used or I've worked with with other companies to help them not only publish to just Fire TV, but also to publish across all of our different platforms. And when we talk about this, it's important to know that at Amazon, uh, we now have one OS that goes across multiple form factors. And what does that mean? Well, for the first time in Amazon's history, we now have a complete device ecosystem for publishing your game from phone to tablet to TV. So the good news about our operating system, which is Fire OS, is that it's actually based on Android. And what that means is that if you're an Android developer, chances are your app already works on our platform. So, and also if your IDE outputs an APK, chances are good that that'll run as well. So now with the launch of Fire Phone, if you have a game that you've been developing for Android phones, we now have a device for you. And not only that, but this device has top-end specs, a dedicated GPU, 2 gigs of RAM, and unique features which you won't find on any other device, such as dynamic perspective, which allows you to use four cameras on the front of the phone to track head movement, and Firefly, which is an API that allows you to access the camera and scan objects in the real world and identify them. Everything from physical goods that you can purchase in a store, down to text that you can find on a business card. If you're building tablet games, we have a range of tablets now at every price point for customers. So our new Fire HD and HDX tablets range from 6, 7, and 8.9 inch sizes. And each tablet has really fast processors as well as high resolution displays. And each one of these has an affordable price point for customers. Then if you're making a PC or a console game, we have the Amazon Fire TV, which is what this talk is going to focus on. And this is a great opportunity for you to bring not only just existing Android apps, but if you're building these desktop or console games, it allows you to bring these games to the living room to a whole new range of customers that may not have dedicated gaming hardware, but are looking more towards streaming set-top boxes. And then we tie our entire platform together with Amazon Gaming Services. Our main gaming service is Game Circle, which offers you leaderboards, achievements, and cloud syncing, which is incredibly important, especially if you're purchasing a game and it runs on all these devices. Being able to sync that data across different devices is key. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how this plays out into responsive game design throughout the talk. It's also important to note that this works with Unity and other third-party frameworks. And then in order to distribute your app, we have the Amazon App Store. So you can reach hundreds of millions of new customers in 236 countries across multiple platforms, and including our Fire Phone, our Fire HD and HDX, and our Fire TV, this store is built into the device. Now, if you're an Android user, if you have the Amazon app for Android, you actually have the Amazon App Store built in. And this allows you to take advantage of our free app of the day, our promotions, and all the apps that are available in our store. You can download them and install them on any Android device. Also, we recently announced that for BlackBerry, we're now the default app store for BlackBerry devices. And if you are doing desktop games, you can also distribute your Mac and PC games through the app store on Amazon.com. So let's talk about Fire TV and the gateway to the living room. So what is Fire TV? Well, this gives you a familiar Android-based platform uh, to extend your apps and games to the big screen. So Fire TV is also a powerful Android-based gaming device. Because you can install apps and games on Fire TV, and we also have an optional controller, you can actually get some pretty interesting games running on this device. And this is all possible because the device is incredibly powerful. There's a quad-core processor, a dedicated GPU, 2 gigs of RAM, and all of this means you can have high-performance gaming in a very small form factor. 
And now with the introduction to Fire TV Stick, what you're going to find is that all the great features you have on regular Fire TV is now available at a much more affordable price point. The only differences that you should keep in mind when you're a game developer is that there's going to be a dual core processor, one gig of RAM, eight gig of storage, just like you'd find on the regular Fire TV. And of course, we also support full HD 1080p output and Dolby Digital Plus surround sound. And what's good about both of these devices, the Fire TV and the Fire TV Stick, is that you're actually able to use multiple types of input in order to control your games. So by default, you're going to get the remote that comes with the Fire TV, and there's an optional game controller that works with the Fire TV and the Fire TV Stick. And we also have full support for local multiplayer. This allows you to have up to seven game controllers connected to a Fire TV at any time. And local multiplayer is becoming a really big thing in gaming. Uh, there's a big resurgence in this type of games. So being able to have these many types of controllers attached to a single device opens up a lot of potential for game developers. And then there's second screen. So currently, we take advantage of Dial, which is an open standard. But as game developers, you can come with your own solution and have any type of phones or tablets or other devices attached to the Fire TV over local Wi-Fi and be able to do second screen experiences as well. And then of course our devices output full 1080p. So if you're an Android developer and you're used to dealing with multiple different types of resolutions, you'll be happy to know that Fire TV just supports one resolution. You simply build for 1080p and the hardware handles downscaling to 720p for you automatically. So let's talk a little bit about what responsive game design is. On the web, responsive game design is a set of guidelines and best practices that help websites scale from desktop to mobile. Primarily, this usually talks about the visual side of scaling from each of these different devices. Most of the time, code is completely reusable, so you're just dealing a little bit with view logic and also with CSS. So when we look at this example, we can see that the website on the left is a desktop and the one on the right is mobile. And what we're doing is when we talk about responsive web design, we simply compartmentalize each block of data or visual data and then we rearrange those blocks in a format that makes more sense on a mobile device or on a tablet or any different form factor given a certain type of resolution. Now, when it comes to games, we can actually adopt a lot of this and we can use responsive game design to build games that work across multiple different platforms. But unlike websites, there's a lot that actually goes into getting a game to run on something completely different from a desktop to a tablet to a phone, even to Fire TV. And so because of that, I've built out this sort of framework of what's entailed in actually making a game adopt responsive game design and work across these different form factors. So there's four different tenets, basically, to follow when doing this sort of practice. One. Game graphics and UI should support multiple resolutions. Two, game mechanics work across multiple types of input. Three, publishing to multiple platforms with the same code base. And four, save data is synced across all the platforms. And we're going to dive into how each one of these will work in your own game. So part one, let's talk about game graphics and UI. So when scaling visuals across different resolutions, it's important to make sure that the UI looks good. And what do I mean by this? Well, if you remember back in the day, uh, a game called Civilization, which was a really good strategy game that I used to play all the time, I remember when it was out on DOS, it finally got released to Mac. And I was a Mac gamer. And one of the things that I noticed was that when Macs had a much higher resolution than PCs at the time, and so when the game got ported over, all of the UI and all the graphics were really, really tiny because the resolution was so high. Now, in mobile, and especially in tablets, when we're dealing with these different form factors and these different resolutions, 
the same thing can actually happen. So it's important as a game developer to take into account that you should design your game at a specific resolution and it should look the same either scaling up or scaling down at all of these different screen resolutions. So the other thing to keep in mind is that when you're going to TV, there's actually some things you need to consider. And this is usually called the 10 foot experience. And that's because you have to design your game and all your UI to be readable when somebody is sitting 10 feet away from the display. The other word for this is usually called the 10 foot user interface. And the goal of the 10 foot user interface is to make user interaction as simple and as efficient as possible. And we sort of take advantage of the fact that now at touch screens, we're able to build all these kind of complicated UI experiences because you can use touch and it's a very immediate response. But if we take a step back and we look at how keyboard input works or we look at controller input, we need to make sure that our game UI supports the most basic input device you'd find on a TV set-top box, especially with Fire TV, which is going to be the remote. So if you look at the UI of the way that Fire TV is set up, you see that we have big information. We have big boxes. Everything is clear and easy to read. The navigation is very simple. At the top, you have your most recent stuff. We surface information so that people don't have to go digging through their libraries of thousands of videos to try to find where things are. We surface that information. You can move to the left to get quick links. So you can go to home, movies, TV. And if you move to the right, you can drill down into each of these objects. And all this is because the default device that comes with the Fire TV and the Fire TV stick is the remote. So you need to be able to have an app that supports up, down, left, right, and select, which is in the middle, as your main core navigation. And then you also see on a remote that we have standard uh, navigation for Android. So we have a menu, we have home, and we have back. And then we have reserved media buttons for playback only. So these you're not able to use in your game. So that leaves you, if you're using the remote, to just four types of input and one select. So when designing for mobile-friendly UI, chances are that if you're building a landscape game already, your design is going to work perfect. Um, the things you need to make sure, though, is that your buttons have states for selected, disabled, and, and any other type of state that you can't normally show if it's not just a touch device. Uh, easy navigation via the Amazon Fire TV remote and clear indication of how to move from one screen to another, right? You don't want people to be stuck in your game and unable to figure out how to move to the next screen. Also, your game is going to have to support multiple resolutions, right? How do we go from desktop to phone to tablet to TV? Well, back when I started experimenting a lot with this, I realized that there's really two aspect ratios that I want to maintain. And it's usually a 16 by 9 or 4 by 3. And within each of these aspect ratios, the UI dynamically adjusts to either of the ratios. And this will help solve a lot of your design problems, especially when you have a 4 by 3. In order to make it 16 by 9, you're simply showing more on either side of the screen. So let's take a quick look at a demo in Unity to show off how this actually works. One of the reasons I like Unity is because you can use a 3D camera even when you're working in 2D. And because of taking advantage of the 3D camera, I'm able to position the camera at just the right focal length in order to achieve the resolution I'm looking for. So here's my Unity project. And as you can see, I have a scene set up, I have a spaceman, and I have a cave. If I hit play, we'll see that I'm running at a resolution of 1024 by 600. Now, one thing that's important to note is that the game looks fine. If I was actually to do a screen capture and try to get the size of this tile, you'll see that it's roughly 105, 106 by 106 here. Now, this is not exact science, it's just for an example. But one thing to note is that each one of these tiles is actually supposed to be 100 by 100. So while it's not totally noticeable, one of the issues is that 
we're not going to get the same resolution across all devices. If I was to go to a smaller resolution and run this, and now if I take a measurement of the size, you'll see that the tile is now 81 by 81. So one thing that we want to do is make sure that there's consistency across different resolutions. Now here I've set up a camera, an orthographic camera, and what it does, if I look at the actual camera itself, is that I can set what the native resolution of the game is, which is 800 by 480. And what this tells the camera is that at 800 by 480, you'll see everything is now bigger. And if I go and I take a measurement of this block, you'll see that this block is now roughly 100 by 100. It should actually be exactly 100 by 100. And that means at 800 by 480, it's always going to be a one-to-one -one ratio. If I was to rerun this game at a higher resolution, and play it again, you'll see everything looks even bigger. And now, when I look at the size of it, you'll see that it's 140 by 140. And what this means is that this camera is actually scaling up now so that you always get the same amount of tiles based on whatever display you're looking at. This way, there's no unfair advantage between higher resolutions and lower resolutions. The same thing can happen with a perspective camera, too. In this case, I wanted to add a little bit of depth of field. So as I fly around, you can see the background moves. And if I go back and change this to its native resolution of 800 by 480 and rerun it, you'll see that everything is going to be at the one-to-one -one ratio of the artwork itself. The last thing is text. So here's some examples of GUI text. And now if I was to run this example, what we'll see is that we have Arial default. This is the default value of fonts in Unity. We've set it here to 20. And then we also have Arial size 20 pixel perfect. And you'll see that this size 20 and this size 20 are actually identical. And that's because we're at the native resolution of 800 by 480. If I was to switch this to a much higher resolution and rerun it again, what you'll see now is that the pixel perfect font is actually larger than the Arial size 20. And what I've done is I've simply taken the scale factor from going from my native resolution all the way up to a higher resolution, and I multiplied the font size by that. So this way, fonts always look the same on any device I'm displaying. Another big thing to take into account is anticipating user navigation flow. So what does this mean? If you have a menu, so here's an example of a store that I have from one of my games. At the end of a level, basically you are able to purchase new weapons. So there's a lot of UI that's going on here, and I needed to simplify this for remote or game controller input. So what we have is at the first box, where we actually show the items you can buy, when you, when you come to this screen, it focuses in on this area. And then if you hit left or right, it'll cycle through all the different weapons. If you hit down, it goes to number two, which is buy. If you hit down again, it goes to continue. And if you hit down again, it'll go all the way up to quit. And then from quit, you can go right back into the store. And so we have this circular motion, meaning that we never want people to be lost in the UI. We always want them to be able to move forward. And if they keep moving forward, they come back to where they started. So now let's talk about input, right? This is the most important part of any game, which is how you actually control the game itself. So if we go back and we look at the evolution of the game controller, we're going to see that we started out with the Tandy and we had one stick and one button. And then if we go down to something like the Xbox 360 controller, you see that we have a D-pad, two sticks, six buttons, two shoulders, two options, a lot of buttons, right? And over the years, games have become increasingly more complicated and require more controllers. But some interesting things to note is that stuff like the ColecoVision and the Atari 5200 actually had a similar number of buttons as the Xbox 360 controller. The only difference is that the ergonomic of the game controller didn't really account for being able to have really complicated controls because if you look at the ColecoVision, it's just a number pad, right? But the Xbox controller places all the buttons in a place where your fingers and your thumbs are able to reach. So one of the things that I focus a lot on, especially when I'm building games that I know are going to go to mobile, is how do I build the simplest controls? 
And for me, the Nintendo gamepad actually solved a lot of the problems because it has one D-pad, so you have up, down, left, and right, and then you have two buttons. And then these two buttons allow you to do some pretty interesting things. So what does it mean when we are going to support controllers across different input types? Well, with a lot of planning and consideration, it's possible to have games work with a single input mechanism across all these different devices. Whenever I'm designing a game, I always think of what is the simplest, uh, least amount of buttons or inputs I can have in that game. And I'm always thinking constantly about the remote. So as I was saying earlier about the Nintendo controller, you actually only had four directions and two buttons. Well, the remote has four directions and one button. So a lot of the times I'll actually simplify my games if I know I'm going to be building for the remote to have the most simple controls as possible. And the remote isn't a limiting thing. In fact, a lot of mobile games actually have one type of input. Uh, if you look at games like Flappy Bird, where all you're doing is a single type of click. The remote actually maps very well to these type of games. So anything like endless runners, turn-based games, and other mechanics that don't require precision input can all be played with the remote. And so again, this is the mapping of the remote. The things to keep in mind is that if you are building a game that you know will end up on Fire TV, is that it supports the remote. Um, now, not all games have to support the remote. I'm going to talk about the game controller, and you could build game controller-only games. But if you want to get the broadest audience, it's going to mean having support for the remote. And if, in that case, you're going to have navigation, which is a selection wheel. You're going to have Android navigation buttons, which you can still use to navigate your own menus, such as menu, home, and back. The media playback buttons, which I said are reserved. And the one thing to note is that voice search isn't an open API to developers. So if you're using Fire TV and you have the voice search remote, you won't be able to use that in your own game. And if we look at the mapping of how these buttons work, we see that the main button, it actually maps to A on the game controller, and the cancel button maps to B, and we have up, down, left, and right. And again, going back to Nintendo, these are the same amount of inputs you had on the original Nintendo console. So if you're building your game in native Android, uh, and you're using Java, you can actually capture any key events by simply looking for a key event and using one of the key event constants. So in this case, you can do D-pad up, D-pad down, D-pad left, D-pad right, and D-pad D center, or the enter key, which is actually the center part of the remote. And we just simply do this by overriding the on key down event listener in our view. And then we have a switch statement that allows us to handle any of these type of events. Now, if you're looking for more input in your game, we have an optional Amazon Fire game controller. And what's great about this is that you'll find the same type of mappings as you're used to on console game controllers. And this allows you a lot more uh, fine tuning of the controls for your game. As you can see, we have all the button layouts here. Um, you're going to have the D pad, you're going to have two analog sticks. You'll have your main navigation of menu, home, and back in the center. We also have a dedicated game circle button. So as I talk a little bit later about what game circle is, you're able to actually pull game circle up and, uh, and see your score and your stats from within the game. And then, of course, we also have a whole slew of other buttons, our shoulders and triggers, and then we have the Y, B, A, and X. So, and the Amazon Fire game controller is perfect for games that require precision controls and multiple buttons. So things like first-person shooters, uh, Grand Theft Auto works really great with this controller, obviously, because Grand Theft Auto was originally designed to be a console game. And then the good news is that if you're already implementing this in native Java, you're actually able to build upon any of the default remote inputs that you build. So if you're using on key down, you're actually able to map these same things over to the controller. Of course, things like the X button, you'll need a key event, key code button X, or any of the other buttons that aren't part of the default um, remote. And then if you want to get access to the analog sticks, you can use an on generic motion event listener, and you can simply go through and pull out the axis of the remote. 
so as I was saying earlier, you can support up to seven Bluetooth game controllers. Um, if you're using our API, only four of these controllers are going to be assigned to player numbers. And I'll talk about what that means in a second. So our game controller API is designed to actually help abstract using um, or accessing the game controller when you're building this in native Java. Now, if you're doing a framework, which I'll show you in Unity in a minute, that framework should actually handle the controller input for you. Now, on Fire TV game controller, there's actually four LED lights that show players one, two, three, and four. And that's why our game controller API maps directly to a player number. So when we talk about the game controller API, here are the things that you're going to get. There's methods to associate the game controller with the player number, as I was just talking about. So this is really good if you want to get controller one, controller two, controller three, etc. Uh, methods to query the controller at, uh, state at any time. There's also input event constants for specific to the gamepad. So things that aren't built into Android, some of the buttons on our gamepad aren't built into um, aren't built in constants to the Android platform. You can now access these through our API. And behavior to enable you to process game put input events at a per frame basis. So this is really important, especially if you have a game loop. Um, well, I showed you some examples of how to get basic input by just listening to events. You really want to be checking this and pooling this on each frame and detecting the differences between input between frames. So let's talk a little bit about cross-platform controls. So I'm going to switch back over into Unity. So here you see I have my player, and if I run this, what's going to happen is, is that the player is going to fall to the ground. And now I can control the player with the keyboard by simply doing up, left, and right. Now this works really good, obviously, on a desktop. Um, and ironically enough, these up, down, and left keys will actually map directly to the game controller. So there's nothing else you need to do. The other thing that works really well here is that this also will map out, because I'm using Unity's input class, it'll map automatically to the analog sticks. So the only other thing that I really need to take advantage of is now that I have this very simple uh, way of interacting with my player, well, how do I handle touch? So if you click down anywhere with the mouse, you'll see that I'm emulating touch, and I now have a virtual joystick. And this virtual joystick is mapped exactly how you'd find on a joystick uh, on a game controller. There's an axis, and this goes to negative 1. This value is 1, and anything up is negative 1 and 1. And what happens is that I simply apply that in the same way that I would apply the normal input. Here, when I use keyboard, I'm actually setting the values directly. When I'm using an analog stick from a game controller or from the virtual remote, I can get a per percentage so I can slowly move him up and control it. And because all these subsystems are abstracted and they all filter down into the player class, the player doesn't even need to care about who's actually controlling him. He just needs to know the value of which direction to move into. The other important thing is to actually detect the platform. And when you're showing the controls to people, make sure you show the controls for the right platform. So on the left, you see as a desktop game, I'm showing the keyboard. When it comes to using a gamepad, I actually show the gamepad itself. And I try to show the buttons so that people can see visually which button they need to press. So let's talk about a single code base. This is the third part of responsive game design. Now, when publishing a single game from the same code base, it's important that you're able to actually reuse as much code as possible. Now, back in the day when you built a game, you'd actually have to port it and completely rebuild it from platform to platform. Uh, sometimes you've got a lot of code reusability, but now there are so many really great frameworks out there to help you manage this. You know, if you're building for each different platform and all different kinds of OSs, don't reinvent the wheel every time. Pick something that'll target all of them so you can focus more time on actually building the game and less on supporting different platforms. So some really great frameworks to think about are Unity, Game Maker, Unreal Engine, and of course HTML5. Now let's talk about part four, which is syncing data. So this to me is the most important part of this entire responsive game design. And the reason is, is that if you're actually building a game and you're releasing it across all these different platforms, you want to be able to let that player take their game with them wherever they go. So now, of course, on our ecosystem and on our devices, 
we have everything integrated through Game Circle. So that means if someone buys a game on a Fire tablet and then plays it on the phone or plays it on Fire TV, they should actually have the same game file saved and go with them along with their gamer profile. And in addition to that, like I was saying about Game Circle, it also gives you the achievements in the leaderboards. And this is important too because there's a lot of people who really get into achievements in the game and you don't want to have to re-unlock re all these achievements on different devices. So by taking advantage of our gaming services and Game Circle, you're actually able to synchronize these three key parts of game data for your users, your achievements, your leaderboards, and the saved data syncing. And all of this is powered by WhisperSync. So WhisperSync is something you might be familiar with with their Kindle Reader devices. Uh, WhisperSync for gaming automatically uh, synchronizes the game data and resolves these conflicts arising from offline and online use. And this is important, right? You also want to make sure that when someone's playing the game offline, like if they're in a subway or they're not connected to the internet, that once they come back online, that they're able to sync that data and you don't have to worry about the conflicts. Of course, as I was saying about achievements, it's really easy to add achievements with Game Circle. Uh, you simply set them up in our Amazon uh, developer portal, and then once you have them set up, you just use the code internally in your game to unlock them. One of the things I suggest, especially if you're building a game across multiple platforms, is to abstract your achievements logic as much as possible so that when your games are running on our devices, it leverages Game Circle, and if you're on another platform, it's leveraging that platform's achievement system. Uh, and also the importance of leaderboards. I mean, I can't stress enough, leaderboards have a huge impact in competitiveness of your game and the retention. So one of the key things that Flappy Birds did really well as a game was that because it was so hard, when you shared your score with others or people in your friend circle, they saw that you got a little bit better than them, and then it drove other people to push to get as far as they possibly can, not just for their own not just for themselves, but to also compete against their friends. And then you can learn more about Game Circle on our developer portal. Uh, there's a lot of documentation around the API, how to implement it, code examples, and everything you need to be successful with Game Circle is all on our developer portal. So now that I've talked in theory about how all this works, let's wrap this up with a real world example. So this is a game that I happen to personally love called Terraria. And Terraria is available on the Amazon App Store. It's available on all of our devices from Fire Phone, Fire Tablet, and Fire TV, of course. And what's great about Terraria is that not only is it a really great app in the Amazon App Store, but it actually was a game that started on desktop. And it went from desktop to consoles, to mobile consoles, to phone, to tablet, across all these different platforms. And one of the things that they've done a really great job about is keeping the gameplay cons as consistent as possible across all these different devices. And what makes Terraria unique is that its gameplay can actually be broken down into four distinct modes. And we're going to talk about three of these in particular. So there's Dig, which allows you to explore the world. There's Build, which allows you to create new structures in the world. There's Fight, which allows you to complete missions and activities. There's Explore, which is a vast open world sandbox environment. And when all these things work together, the experience is really incredible. Now, each of these different modes, though, has a very unique style of input, and they lend themselves to different types of devices or different types of scenarios of how you would actually play. And what's really interesting, too, is that there are some scenarios where I may want to do it more on mobile when I'm on the go, and then come back and play these things when I can sit down on the couch and play it on Fire TV. So let's talk about digging. So digging is ideal for touch screens while on the go. You're actually able to go through, explore the world, collect resources, and do kind of light activities inside of the game. And this allows you to build up your inventory that you can use later on in the game. And then we come to building. So building works really well on touch screens and controllers uh, when you need to use a little bit more detail or have a little bit more control over it. 
So there are people who build incredibly elaborate um, buildings. Usually the stuff that I build is just a box with you know, walls and a window maybe, just enough for me to survive. But people go through and build these huge houses and underground cave systems and all these kind of things. And, you know, this is good that you can actually continue to build on the go on a touch screen, or if you prefer to use a game controller, you can do that as well. And then there's fighting. So all these videos are from the actual PC version. You're going to see that there's lots of particles. The PC and the mobile version are very similar. But the one thing, at least just coming from being a classic gamer, is that I, I still find it hard to do uh, touch controls for anything as complicated as this kind of fighting. So in this case, when it comes to fighting, I prefer to actually use a game controller. So I'll sit down on Fire TV. I'll take all the stuff that I've already been building all day long, which has already been syncing on my phone or my tablet. And then when I get home, I'm able to continue doing the more complicated stuff, like the boss battles and going on more epic journeys or going deeper into the underground where there's more difficult bad guys to fight. And what makes all this re work really well on our platform is that Terraria is taking advantage of Game Circle's Whisper Sync to making it possible to do that switch. You know, it's, it's not a small feat to be able to go and take the same game data across all these devices. And I think that, you know, this play experience works really well because there are just days where I don't have time to sit down in front of the TV. Maybe my wife is watching TV or the kids are watching TV, but I might have my tablet. So I'm able just to still play around in the game. And I think that for game developers, having this kind of retention is really important. It means that your, your players can actually play the game on any device that they have on them at that time, and they're going to continue to play the game. And by having a game design that allows them to scale their gameplay from whether they're on the go to sitting down and able to dedicate and focus their attention means that you're going to get a lot more playtime out of that person. So where do we go from here? So there's a lot of documentation on how to get started with Fire TV and Fire TV Stick. All this stuff you can find on developer.amazon.com. Uh, everything from setting up your dev environment all the way down to actually how to publish and submit to the store. And then if you want to learn a little bit more about responsive game design, I have a blog post where I sort of outline my thoughts, and it was the basis for this talk. So this goes into a little bit more detail around each of these topics. And then if you have a game and you're looking to publish your game on the Amazon App Store, take a look at this post that I wrote. This breaks down sort of our gaming strategy and what we love for developers to bring their game over to our platform and also how to integrate with it very well so that you can take advantage of the stuff I've been talking about like Game Circle and each of our devices, especially how they factor in to different customers at different price ranges. And with that, I wanted to thank you. Uh, don't forget to check out the developer.amazon.com uh, website. This is where you'll find all the resources and all of our development. And if you want to look at more blog posts by me, uh, I have a bit.ly here that's just free J dash Amazon without any vowels. And thank you for coming up for my reInvent talk. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Jesse Freeman. And if you're working on a game or you have something you want to share or you're just uh, looking for some more information, feel free to email me at freej at amazon.com.